The UK Defence Minister gives a stark warning that the current world order is crumbling and it's becoming more likely that the use of biological and chemical weapons is in the future. Moderate Republicans ponder splitting from the party of Donald Trump as impeachment hearings continue and another of the big oil companies puts out its plan to convert from fossil fuels by 2050. My name's Malin Baker, this is The Malin Baker Show. This week, the UK Defence Secretary Ben Wallace said that there's a growing risk of chemical and biological attacks and this is because world order is breaking down. States are ignoring long-established international rules. Some regimes have now come to see it as acceptable to use nerve agents and pathogens against their opponents. The comments were reported by the Times of London after it was given access to Porton Down, the UK government's defence laboratory where much of its military research is carried out. Professor Tim Atkins, a microbiologist at Porton Down, said that threats from biological engineering and synthetic biology are at the point where they've been invented but not yet fully exploited. And now Ben Wallace is saying that malign states are passing nerve agents to proxies or to terror groups. And we've already seen the use of chemical nerve agent Novichok by the Russian state itself. And as more sophisticated technology is being developed, the chances are getting higher that it will be used again. In principle, that should see Russia thrown out of the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons and declared a rogue state. But that's not happening. And this is one of the big signs that world geopolitics is making things possible that we dismissed as unlikely for decades. You can see this playing out in the most confused and contradictory way that the EU is dealing with both Russia and China. Germany is placing a high strategic priority on the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, which will boost access to Russia's huge reserves of natural gas. It's highly controversial, as you might expect, because many, and this includes many within Europe, thinks that it represents a major lever for Russia to exert a powerful influence on Europe. The relationship between Germany and Russia is somewhat mixed. Gerhard Schroeder, a former Chancellor, chairs the Nord Stream 2 supervisory board and is also a personal friend of Putin's. Germany has become dependent on Russia's energy since, after the Fukushima nuclear accident in Japan, Merkel took the decision to phase out nuclear power in Germany, which has led the country, hilariously to some given its green commitments, to become more reliant on fossil fuels and specifically on Russian gas. The United States is not happy. Biden administration is putting a high priority on stopping Germany from becoming dependent on Russia. Now, in the old world, with stable alliances, that pressure would be very telling. But the point is, that stability is what's breaking down. Reportedly, Angela Merkel has concluded after last year's election that the political phenomenon of Trump is not going away and may one day return to lead the US government again. That has moved her from a position of strong support for transatlantic relations in her earlier years to one of pushing European strategic autonomy, a position that's apparently supported by President Macron of France, as I've noted here before, who said recently that the US and EU interests were not aligned. Now, not everyone in Europe agrees. And this is one of the things that's going to push the institution of the EU to breaking points. Poland and the Baltic states particularly have a huge fear of Russian power. Kaja Kalas, the Prime Minister of Estonia, called on the EU in advance of a planned meeting to discuss relations with Russia to stick to applying sanctions against it. Russia relations with Germany might be warm, but it's made clear it doesn't extend the same warmth to the EU itself. The EU's foreign policy chief, Josep Borrell, was humiliated on a trip to Moscow this week when Russia took the opportunity to accuse EU leaders of lying about the poisoning of Navalny and called the bloc an unreliable partner. After he left, Borrell learned from Twitter that Russia had expelled diplomats from key EU countries that had attended demonstrations in support of Navalny. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that Moscow was ready to sever ties with the EU if it imposed significant sanctions. 
Now, the United States is applying sanctions of its own. It threatens sanctions against any company with ships capable of finishing the Nord Stream pipeline. And that threat led to the company All Seas pulling from the project. But Russia then produced a company of its own that could finish the work. And Germany set up an innocuous looking climate foundation that turned out to be a front for Nord Stream, which would be exempt from US sanctions. You might say it sounds like the gloves are coming off and you would be right. This may be good news for Britain in some ways. It rather underpins exactly why the US and the UK traditionally had a special relationship rather than the US and the EU or the US and Germany. Joe Biden may not be a fan of Brexit, but with the UK lining up as critical of both Russia and China, the common purpose and outlook on the world between the two countries may well be what wins out. Which would be good, because the EU is currently fighting aggressively against its former member. We've seen the fights over vaccines, which we covered before. This week, Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, which is independent of the UK government, took the almost unheard of step of accusing Brussels of picking a fight against the London financial markets based on self-interest and in a way that could harm recovery from the pandemic. London has applied for an equivalence ruling that would give British banks access to the European Union markets. Canada, the US, Australia, Hong Kong and Brazil all have that. But the EU doesn't want to give it to London. Bailey said this, The EU has argued it must better understand how the UK intends to amend the rules going forwards. This is a standard that the EU holds no other country to and would, I suspect, not agree to be held to itself. He said that open financial systems have been key to global prosperity and they would be key to recovery. But add to that what has been apparently deliberate policy to apply punitive levels of red tape to UK EU trade, specifically to punish Brexit, you end up wondering what now is the EU mindset that was once so clear about the value of the Western alliance in the face of the anti-democratic forces that were seen as a threat to the world, and particularly in the face of the EU's concluding its agreement with China recently, even as others were arguing that it was extremely unfortunate timing. There's no doubt that the period of geopolitical stability of the last few decades seems to be hastening to an end. Pushed by the emerging power of China, pushed by the emerging aspirations to parallel statehood of the EU, pushed by reaction to the Trump years, and pushed, of course, by the fallout from the pandemic. We may be entering a new period when global politics is becoming intensely interesting again. Now, in a minute, we'll get to the rest of the week's news. But first, the World Health Organization investigation in Wuhan this week held its press conference to mark the end of the team's visit. They told the world that they were no closer to discovering the source of the pandemic. There was only really one thing that they did want to say conclusively, and that was that they were ruling out the suggestion that it could have leaked from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. This is, I would put it to you, a rather remarkable statement. The US government clearly thought so as well. It said that it was going to reserve its judgment. Thank you very much. So where are we on the question of whether the virus could have started with a leak from the Wuhan laboratory? What's the current state of the evidence? Why are so many people dissatisfied with the nature of the WHO's investigation? I will be doing a deep dive on all of that in the video going live on this channel on Monday, 7pm UK time. Join me there. The impeachment drama continues, like watching the lacklustre sequel of a movie that you remember only too late you didn't even like the first one much either. Trump's lawyers have managed to astonish the nation with the idea that even with his back to the wall, the former President of the United States wasn't able to find better lawyers to represent him. Which doesn't affect the fact that he won't be found guilty, because the majority of Republicans won't vote to convict. Democrats continue to show footage of Trump saying, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore, while ignoring the fact that he also said peacefully and patriotically protest The truth is that saying you have to fight for your country is the sort of thing that politicians say day in and day out without anyone ever suggesting that they mean it as an incitement to actual violence. 
But where the Democrats have more of a case is their argument that I made as well in my review of President Trump's term in office, that by insisting from the earliest times that the only way he could lose an election would be because of fraud, but in so doing, he created the circumstances that made the Capitol building riot possible. And that is a much stronger case. Whether it would be strong enough to convict him is another matter. The burden for proof for incitement is, correctly in my view, a very difficult one to meet. But it doesn't really matter because Democrats know that they won't get a conviction and it's not the point. The political objectives from the exercise really comes from the no-win position it puts their opponents in. If senators support the Trump conviction, they will be attacked by the Republican Party pro-Trump base as Liz Cheney's already found out. And if they don't, then the Democrats will aim to make it stick that in so doing, they associated themselves with everything bad that Trump ever did and with the January the 6th riots in particular. Now, that's nonsense, of course, but it's politics. And at the very least, they know that the issue is driving a wedge into the heart of the Republican Party. And that's something that could give them a good shot at a longer period of dominance in government than they've had for a long time. Case in point, in spite of the impeachment action, Trump's grip on the Republican Party remains as tight as ever. And this week, that led moderate Republicans, including more than 120 former officials who served former Republican administrations, to meet to consider whether they should form a third party that would be a principled, effective centre-right movement. According to an attendee speaking anonymously, multiple ideas were floated along with debate as to whether an initiative needed to be inside or outside the current party. Generally to date, attempts to break the US two-party system have failed miserably. You have to wonder, if Trumpism consolidates its hold on Republicans, and if post-Joe Biden the Democrats moved into the hands of a more radical leftist base, whether a moderate centre party, which might attract moderate Democrats as well, might not emerge to test whether the majority of Americans really are in the centre, as they tend to tell pollsters that they are. And if they did, whether they just might break that mould in a historic way. It's hard to imagine, but you never know. Meanwhile, other big institutions are undergoing radical changes that we never thought possible. One big one this week was the launch by Shell PLC of its commitment to achieving net zero carbon by 2050 and some of the headlines for how it intends to go about doing that while hopefully remaining successful. The pandemic's already hit the price of oil hard and consequently Shell posted a $19.9 billion loss for 2020. Shell believes its oil turnover peaked in 2019 and will now decline 1-2% to per year as its focus shifts towards liquefied natural gas, biofuels, hydrogen and chemicals. By 2030, it'll be selling low-carbon electricity and operating 2.5 million electric car charging points, along with producing eight times as many low-carbon fuels such as hydrogen and biofuels. It's going to be aiming at some of the difficult areas, such as aviation fuel, targeting that with its expanding biofuel operations. And that's where many will sound a highly sceptical note. Because biofuel, for instance, in Shell's case, they make ethanol from sugarcane grown in Brazil. Biofuel is the least power-dense way of producing fuel of any that we use. Biofuel uses a huge amount of land. If you expand it majorly, you have to expand the quantity of land you take out of producing food and turn it to producing fuel. These big corporations are problem-solving beasts. If anyone could do it, I dare say they could, but some will certainly be sceptical about that component. In other signs of momentum, or lack of, the Cumbrian coal mine I reported on last week, which was going ahead with the government refusing to override the local authority, Well, that's now come grinding to a halt, as the local authority itself decided to think again. According to the BBC, Cumbrian councillors will reconsider the mined application in the next few weeks in the light of the climate change evidence that wasn't available last time they considered it. You might wonder what that climate change evidence is that somehow has emerged in the last couple of weeks. What do we know today that we didn't know when they took the decision? And the answer, of course, is Nothing. You might imagine that the local councillors were playing a cynical political game where they would approve a project that will create local jobs, 
totally in the belief that then the big bad national government will be forced to jump in over their heads and cancel it. So they get the credit for supporting the jobs while also being able to blame their opponents for the loss while also avoiding the blame from environmentalists for creating a working coal mine. You might imagine that when that didn't happen, they then realise with a sickening lurch in the stomach that maybe they're going to have to do their own dirty work. You might well think that I couldn't possibly comment, except to observe that such things have been known to happen in politics. And I don't know these people. I'm not a mind reader, but all I do know is that new information about climate change since the decision was taken is Class A political BS. Now, maybe calling such a thing out will get me cancelled. Goodness knows I would be in distinguished company this week. The San Francisco Schools Board is renaming schools that were named after George Washington, as was sadly too ordinary at the time. He was a slave owner. I mean, he also did some extraordinary things as well by the standards of his time and indeed by ours. But, you know, details. Abraham Lincoln, a uh, slave liberator. But, well, you know, didn't attend classes on critical race theory or something. Captain Cook, who has two museums now considered to be problematical. According to Black Lives Matter, Cook invaded Australia and New Zealand and murdered lots of people. Which isn't what happened, but ugh, details. And even uber-liberal Diane Feinstein, who in 1984, when she was mayor of San Francisco, she allegedly allowed a Confederate flag to fly among a large display of other flags. A protester pulled it down and they allege that she put it back. She says she didn't put it back, but you shouldn't believe what racists say, so... Also this week, we have actress Gina Carano who's been playing a blinder as the character Cara Dune in Disney's The Mandalorian. Apparently, she tweeted a perfectly valid point that political evil starts with a process whereby people start the, of demonising an outgroup. She did so with a comparison to Jews and Nazis, of course. And if you're on the right, which unusually for Hollywood she is, that's the sort of thing that can get you cancelled. Disney sector, her agent sector. Former Japanese Prime Minister has been forced to resign as the Tokyo Olympics chief for saying in a private meeting that board meetings with lots of women take longer because women are competitive. If one member raises their hand to speak, others think they need to talk too. And then there's this fella. Not yet then. Surely only a matter of time before they get past all those big beasts and get down here to the pond life. Now, in a minute, we'll respond to some comments and give the final thought for the week. But first, wind turbines have become cheaper than coal plants and countries like the UK are planning to install a whole lot more of them over the coming decades. But they remain controversial. For some people, they are a disastrous choice and countries going in that direction are creating a heap of trouble for themselves. They take up masses of space, which could be used way more productively for food or for forests. They cost more than you think they do, because you have to add the infrastructure to cope with their intermittency. They kill birds and bats in large numbers, and while some people think they look majestic, others think they are just plain ugly. Now, if we stand back and look at the facts, do the critics have a point? How powerful are the arguments against wind turbines? Do they constitute a necessary evil that we need to acknowledge and mitigate? Or are they sufficiently powerful that we should be looking to alternative solutions? It's an area with strong, angry opinions, exactly the sort of minefield we like to wander through on this channel. So I'll be looking at that question in the video going live next Wednesday at 7pm UK time. Join me then. The video on conspiracy theories this week got a lot of feedback. There were two groups of comments that stood out. One was the group that reflected just how many people on the right have had the label conspiracy theorists thrown at them by others whenever they say anything that challenges some of the orthodox thinking. As a result, they were pretty defensive about the term in the first place, and that made them somewhat resistant to the nature of the discussion that I was trying to have. 
One comment that summed this up in the most succinct form, there were many others, was this one. What is missing is the latest version of a conspiracy theory, the one that the political opponent is a conspiracy theorist anyway, and therefore need not be taken seriously and can be laughed at. Now, I take the point. Name calling is standard in political rhetoric, and sadly, in spite of my best efforts, also in the comments forums of these videos, but I think that given that the real extreme examples, like the QAnon conspiracy, the Great Reset conspiracist, the 5G, the lizard people and all the rest, all of them being labelled as belonging to that group, it becomes a charge that really stings. I wouldn't have changed the substance of the video if I'd realised that a bit more fully, but I certainly would have made an acknowledgement of how that's been playing out and how the accusation of being a conspiracy theorist has been weaponized. So that was one group. The other was a whole bunch of people arguing with the definition that said that real conspiracies have historically been limited in objectives and scope, apply to relatively small numbers of conspirators, and they're over a short period of time. However, I also said that this wasn't including the actions of state actors, especially security services in that definition, because they fall under a slightly different category. Because secrecy and covert operations is built into security services, you can get these instances of abuse of power, where the license that they get to operate can be abused, and because they have strict hierarchical discipline, that can remain the case for a longer time period than conspiracies that depend on, you know, loose groups of conspirators maintaining discipline and total secrecy. So one commenter talked about the MK Ultra program, the CIA program where they illegally tested drugs on people that they wanted to use in interrogations. That counts as a real life conspiracy. It went on for a longer time period than most, from 1953 to 1973, precisely because of its location in the darkest corners of government. Someone else asked this. If, prior to the breaking of the Iran-Contra scandal, someone had said that he thought the CIA was bringing cocaine into the US, where would that person fit in your logic? Would he have been a conspiracy theorist? And the answer is, well, it depends. Yes, real-life conspiracies do exist, particularly if what's suggested fits within those three criteria. Then the question becomes this. Where's the evidence and does it stack up? If someone runs around the discussion forums of YouTube saying that the government is smuggling in cocaine, wake up, sheeple! And then you ask them why they think that and they can't tell you or they point to an unsubstantiated claim on a blog somewhere, then yes, that's a conspiracy theorist. This is the difference between journalistic investigation and conspiracy theory, supporting evidence, and only the degree of certainty that's justified by the amount of that evidence. It's another tell for conspiracy theorists, not just lack of evidence, but total certainty in spite of that lack of evidence. You can't stand in the way of progress. That's what we used to get told anyway. Today's lead feature made me think about this. There was a view that technology kept getting better and better. Whatever comes tomorrow will be better than what we have today. There was a view that history was the process of countries finding their way, maybe slowly and painfully, but relentlessly to the point where they become democracies. With the fall of the Soviet Union, we even entertained the fantasy that it was the end of history. Those on the left would see progressive politics as being about the step-by-step -step process of making society fairer and more equal. Those on the right look at the remarkable history of capitalism from the Industrial Revolution to today at how it reduced absolute poverty worldwide and say that more capitalism will equal more progress of more of the same. All of those things are wrong. They all hinge on the straight line fallacy. You see a current trend and you assume that the future must necessarily see the extension of that line on its current trajectory forever. The truth is that in human history, technology and knowledge have sometimes gone backwards. The Dark Ages followed the fall of the Roman Empire, after all. Authoritarian government has been advancing, not retreating in recent decades. Progressive leftists have discovered fault lines between feminists and trans activists. One group's progression can be another's regression, which, you know, was always evident. It just didn't necessarily previously affect one of the groups that they care about. 
And with the current position in the world, with the commitment to financial freedom beginning to be valued less than political power plays, it's entirely possible for all that progress on creating global wealth and reducing poverty, that is going to go backwards for a time before it goes forward again. And if that sounds bleak, well, maybe it should, but it's also normal. Our genuine progress as a species through history has often come with two steps forward, followed by one step backward. What that really means is that we, most of all, have to get rid of the lazy, complacent attitude that we've developed in recent decades that everything gets better without much effort on our part. Entropy is a thing. The hard-won gains our society has won will gradually degrade and fall apart the moment we sit on them and take them for granted. You keep entropy at bay with new injections of energy. People engaged on big work don't worry about small things. It's a choice that we all get to make. Well, that's all for this week. My video on Monday got briefly demonetised by YouTube, but then reinstated on appeal. I rather wonder what might happen with next Monday's video on the WHO lab leak story, since an article by Unheard on the same topic got slapped with a warning when it was shared on Facebook. I'm assuming it will be fine, but it's one of the most important topics right now, so it's what we want to talk about. And that's an easy equation made even easier by the support that people give to this channel via Patreon, meaning that we don't have to self-censor based on what YouTube advertisers will support. It also enabled me to up the production to three videos per week, which is now settling into a routine that many people have responded very positively to. That simply wouldn't be possible without it. So if you would like to join the good people who already support the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to produce on this channel, please go to patreon.com forward slash Malin Baker. I say it every week and every week it's true. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. <laughs>